when I first came to New York, I didn't know anything about it. I got there. When I got there, I thought Manhattan was Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx, Staten Island. I had no idea what I was doing. But the Lord, he, he really did have a plan. He had a plan, and, you know, he unfolded that over time. Uh, today, I'm really blessed because now God has opened up. We have a church in Manhattan. We're right in the village. If you know anything about New York, we're located right in between NYU and Cooper Union. And so we get a lot of young people, but we also get a lot of people with nefarious attitudes and things going on. So, you know, it's a, it's, it's a discernment ministry in a sense because you're dealing with so many different things at one time. But uh, it's been blessed, and today I'm going to talk to you about the beginnings, how it all began, and where it's going, and of course, how the gospel, prophecy, and staying the course played into my life. So why don't we go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll open this message up. I'll pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your promise that you'll never leave us or forsake us, that you'll always be here. And dear Lord, today we pray, God, that you'll open ears, Lord. Allow me to say the things I'm supposed to say. And Lord, I just pray that those who receive it will receive it as a blessing in graciousness, God, in a way for them to go forward with you. And Father, you have many mouths, but one voice. And Lord, I pray tonight, in spite of me, my weakness, anything in me, Lord, help me to get out of the way and draw closer and nearer to you. In the wonderful name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. So, um, Going back to where I want to begin, I'm going to start in the, uh, actually, I'm going to go back to the 1970s. And what I want to do is, before I do that, I'm going to go through a couple verses, because I think they're foundational, they're almost like a platform verse for what I want to talk about. And we'll, I'll read them. First one is, is Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Proverbs 25, 25 says, Like cold water to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. Matthew 24, 12 says, And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But here's the one I want to really focus on today, because I think it's relevant for the time, and it's relevant for the church and for us, and it's Proverbs 24, 11, and 12. It says, rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, behold, we didn't know this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does, he not, does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will he not repay a man according to his work or deeds in some translations? So the idea of preaching the gospel, it's an ongoing thing. It hasn't ended. Uh, As a matter of fact, when catching up with Jacob, I talked a little bit about my salvation in the 1970s. In 1971, when I got saved, there was a fire. There was an amazing kind of outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now, I know it happened on the West Coast, but on the East Coast, it was slightly different. On the West Coast, they were, they were connected. Chuck Smith, you had some kind of connection to the church. On the East Coast, where I got saved, it was young people just getting saved by the droves. Now, we would see people coming back from Vietnam, strung out in heroin, 125 milligrams a day, Coming to salvation, turning their lives around. We would see people that you would never, ever think. People that were proud, people in the rock bands, the whole thing. I mean, people were just getting saved, and it was incredible. I mean, you know, it was a little different then. To me, it was like the Eastern worldview that you see now, mysticism. When I walk through the streets of New York, um, I see so many different people with so many different views. When I got saved, it was like either you were Catholic you were Lutheran, or you were an atheist. There was nothing really fancy about it. Matter of fact, uh, two weeks before I got saved, I had an epiphany, really. What happened to me was I was drag racing with my friend, and we were going down Route 22 in Allentown, Pennsylvania. 
I'm in a Dodge Dart. He's in a Chevelle 454. It wasn't really much of a race, but we're flying down the roads, 100 miles an hour. All of a sudden, I come up, and I look. My, the fen- my friend was way ahead of me, but I, I look, and I saw a car. I saw the front end of the car, and I saw a back end of a car, but they were like 30 yards apart. So I just said, let me pull my car over for a second here. I pull over, I get out of the car, I take two steps, and there's a light shining. I look down, and someone's sitting there, or not sitting there, laying there, and they're dead. And I tell you, I heard a voice that said to me, that could be you. Now, the following week, a week after, that really had an effect on me. And all my friends, they, they went and they, they uh, decided there was a church service going on. We're going to run through the middle of the church, church service because we were radicals. I was in the Socialist Workers Party. We were insane. You know, the, the East Coast thing was similar to the West Coast. LSD, rock and roll, uh, just promiscuous behavior, just whatever it was we could do. It, we did it. We did it. So my friends and me, we go to this church, and the plan is we're going to run through the middle of the church, break up the service. We're all going to say praise Satan. It was unbelievable. And so I had this experience the week before that. So what I do is I go with them, and we're ready to run in the church, and all of a sudden, this conviction hits me and says, you know, the Holy Spirit was saying to me, what are you doing? So my friends, they, they go running through, and I'm actually the last person. And the people, you know, elderly people, everyone's freaked out and scared, and we run through. We had the plan. We ran out the back door, and we're, we're yelling things, and it was really strange. So I was convicted. So the very next week, I knew I had to go back. I knew I had to go back because I was under conviction. I used to read the Bible, and, you know, I was thinking about, you know, I was Catholic. I used to say the Our Fathers and the Hail Marys, and I'd repeat them and repeat them and repeat them. And so I go back the next week to the church, and I go up to the front door, ready for the service. I go, it's locked. Of all, we're on, we're, uh, we're, we're taking a retreat this weekend. So I was convicted to go back, and I go back, and it's a retreat, and the doors are locked. So that was that. It kind of faded for a while until... Finally, the Lord did finally get a hold of me, and it was a quite a powerful night when I got saved. Um, but that was the 1970s. You know, it, it was uh, it was a powerful night when I when I came to salvation. I the battle over in my heart was over uh, whether you know they were showing me you got to get born again. I kept saying I'm a Catholic, and on and on it went. Finally, I was willing to li- listen. We had smoked a dime of grass, drank a bottle of Akadama wine. I was out of it. Here, here's a, an amazing thing that happened. This is the true story. This is what happened to me when I got saved. It was a girl that my friend, we were going to go out. What we would do is drive around all night and drink and smoke dope. And uh, he said, hey, somebody invited me to come to this Jesus freak thing. Do you want to go? So I, I said, hey, look, let me, let me go. Let me check it out. I'll go with you. And this one girl's there, and you could meet her and whatever. So we go there. And um, I had this battle going on when they came over to talk to me. It was over, you know, you're Catholic, but the Bible says you got to get born again. Back and forth it went, back and forth it went. Finally, I just, uh, they showed me John 3, 3, and I was convicted and said, listen, I'm going to get saved. But I was stoned. So I'm praying the sinner's prayer. They say, repeat after me. I want you, want to, want you to say this prayer. So I'm stoned. I'm praying. Halfway through the prayer, I got completely straight. I said, what is this? I got to the end of the prayer, and I was higher than I was when I walked in. I said to them, holy cow, I'm high. And they said to me, that's the Holy Spirit. You just got filled with the Holy Spirit. And it was like, my, that was the beginning of a journey that the Lord took me on. That was the beginning of the journey. Now, in the 1970s, what happened, we were in a, a crazy group. It wasn't that way at first. Um, Jacob, I met him in New York. We were both in there for a little while. But in the 1970s, the idea of evangelism was just something innate. It was something that we did. It was You didn't have to plan it. You just wanted to tell people about Jesus, and it was everywhere. Now, we were young. 
We didn't know a lot. We didn't know anything about doctrine. But we saw things in the paradigm of like, look, this is Laodicea. Or we didn't even know about that. But this is, things are lukewarm. You know, everything, people are, it's lukewarm. We've got to go out and hit the streets and evangelize. And we started to do it. And I'll tell you, people started to get saved, one after the other after the other. Now, I knew, and it's, now let me fast forward a little bit. I'm in New York, and the Lord shows me, you know, this is around the year 2000. He says to me, look, uh, New York City needs a Bible-based church. And I'm thinking, that's true. I went to some of the bigger churches, and it, it really... It was raise your hand, it was come up to the altar, and, I, and, and what really would get to me was it was the same 10 people or 20 people every week that were getting saved, and I couldn't understand that. I'm like, what, what's going on, man? Like, it's the same 20 people over and over and over, and uh, this reminds me of my Catholic church. What am I doing? You know, what's going on? But I knew that God said to me, I want a Bible-based church in New York. Now, you would think a city of 8 million people, you'd find churches everywhere. And don't get me wrong, there are solid churches in the city, but it got, it was really, really, it was an adventure to find one. It really was. Now, I used to go to Times Square Church. I used to be there, and I, I've spoken to David Wilkerson on occasion, and um, the church there was where I went initially. I would go there, but I knew the Lord wanted something special because I, I knew something from when I first got saved, that that personal walk, that personal relationship where people were in community and friendship and you knew each other, you know, that was missing. The big church atmosphere was you come in, you leave, nobody knows anybody, praise the Lord, brother, you know, this and that. And it really didn't, didn't have any kind of effect. The other thing that bothered me was service would be over and... It's not about the Bible. It's about the Mets, the Jets. I could have been unsaved and just hung out, you know? The bar sometimes. Not me, but it, it, that's really the, the, the depth of what was going on. So I knew that Jesus wanted something more. Now, I saw the verse, Isaiah 5, 9 says, The Lord of hosts has sworn in my hearing, Surely many houses shall be desolate large and beautiful houses without inhabitants. We have beautiful churches in New York. Some of them are now pizzerias. Where A.B. Simpson first began the Nyack Bible College, uh, just up the road from where we are, uh, he used to preach, I forget the name of the church, but that is a pizzeria now. We, these it, Things were evolving. I saw it happening in front of my eyes. What is going on? What is happening? And what does God want me to do? Now, again, I'd said 1970, outpouring of the Holy Spirit, preaching the gospel, people getting saved. Wonderful. 1980, less. 1990, less. 2000, less. Today, hardly never. Where? I used to come into New York and see guys with the sandwich boards on in Times Square. I would hear people preaching and talking about the gospel. I remember one time in 1974, I got up on a wall at Washington Square Park. I'm 21 years old, and I just decided, hey, I'm going to talk about Jesus. And believe it or not, I must have had two, 300 people. We want proof. We want proof. That's not there at this point. Now, the churches today that I've seen, and no knock, there, there are some beautiful brothers and sisters there, but it was largely transfer growth. People going from church A to church B, on and on it would go. And people are really, were being drawn by, it became almost like, a, a, not a rock concert, but like bringing in all the personalities and the, the Broadway atmosphere, and um, it just didn't sit right with me. Things just didn't seem right. It was almost all the gimmicks, the strobe lights, uh, you know, and then we have Hill, Hell Song or Hill Song, you know, and all this stuff. It was like, it just, things didn't sit right with me. It did not sit right in my heart because I knew this. 
And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. That's not an option, I don't think. I think it's something God has called me to do. I think it's something that he's called us to do. And it's not hard. Man, I was out here, and my daughter lives in Santa Clarita. And it was amazing. It was like, I went out, I had my tracks, I went out, I was talking to people, and it was like, everybody took a track. Come to New York sometime. See the difference. Um, it, is, it is quite different. It is quite different. Now, Mark 16, 15 says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. That's awesome. That's what the Lord said to do. He said it to me. Look, sound doctrine, foundational. Prayer, foundational. Preaching the gospel, Part of what God called us all to do. Part of what God called us all to do. Look at this. Look at, look at the example of Paul. It says, so he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplaces every month with those who happened to be there. Now, every day. Every day. Now, it's not works. It's a joy. When you see someone get saved, oh, my goodness. I got these young guys. These young kids that Jesus is bringing and drawing, you know, with the pandemic. Here's the thing I saw with the pandemic. A lot of these kids got online. And while they're going on their computers, the Lord had them run into these preachers. And there was like a, a moment in time where conviction was brought. I mean, I've been going out every week in New York City since 2003 on the streets of the city, weekly, as much as possible. And I saw the change after COVID. I saw an opening. And these young people that are being so deprived and depressed and trapped in, uh, you know, they're looking at this world and saying, what hope do I have? What, what, what am I going to do with my life? What is going to become of me? I need a dad. I need a father. There's so many without fathers. I need, I need purpose in my life. I need direction. Well, you come to the resurrection of Jesus, and he's going to give you the direction. You come to Jesus, and he'll give direction. And that's what he began to do with these young people. And I saw it right after COVID. All of a sudden, people started coming to us and saying, would you pray for us? Would you, you know, I need help. Please, tell me more about Jesus. One of the beautifulest things I've seen is them get the same kind of inspiration that we got in 1970. We have young people now leading people to Jesus. They are inspired. See, nothing has changed. Nothing, the culture's changed. I'm going to mention that in a second. But look, here, here's the obstacles that we've all got. It says, the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. You trust in the Lord. He's going to work through you. You don't need a whole lot of knowledge. We didn't know anything, but we love Jesus, and we let our light shine, and it, God bless that. And nothing is new. Nothing is new. Now, Yeah, yeah, I was going to say nothing, nothing is new and nothing has changed. The gospel is the same. Nothing's changed. What's happened? Okay, so praise the Lord, we've gotten back to sound doctrine. But then there's prayer. Another thing the Lord led us to do, for nine years up until COVID, two times a week we'd have a prayer meeting in McDonald's, three hours a day. God is able, and we prayed and we prayed for our church, and we prayed for the city of New York, and we prayed, and we, nine years, we didn't miss one week. And COVID hit, and we were forced because we don't have our own facility. We're actually in the first fireproof building that was built in New York, and we meet in the vault. The vault, it was a bank. We meet in the vault. So, I mean, you know, nine years we met, we prayed. God, uh, God opened some amazing doors for us to be able to do it. Now, uh, you know, we, we, the, the, perhaps the culture's changed, things have changed, 
we've been, there's been so many, we see immigration, open borders, we see that, but it, it, long before that, whether the immigration was legal, people brought ideas and views that were totally different than what the 1970s, late 60s, it was a different view, but that's okay, that's okay. Look, at, it says, what, is, what does it say in Luke? It says, and the master said to the servants, here's the command, go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. Hebrews 10.25 says, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, thank God for Brother Jacob, different uh, teachings, you know, we can see things. Through Bible teachers, they're, they're, it's becoming much more clearly that we're heading for this eschaton, that things are coming to a head. The, the convergence of events, the way things are happening so rapidly, we're seeing this. So we see these things happening. We see these things happening so quickly and we, we understand that all the more when we see these things, it should be an impetus for us to be motivated to want to see God use us. And it's great to sit and hear the word of God. Wonderful. But wait till you speak the word of God. Wait till you allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. Wait till somebody says, I want more of what you've got. I want to hear more about Jesus. I want to, I want to come to salvation. I want, I want this Jesus. Now, Matthew 25, the wise and the foolish virgins, they had oil in their lamps. They were being fed the word of God. They were hearing the word of God. But take notice, the very next parable is the parable of the talents. There's no chapter division there. It's investing your talents. This is what God is trying to get us to do. Look, we, we see these things coming. They don't. You know, isn't it marvelous that we can actually, we see it, they don't. There's a veil on their eyes, that's true, but if we pray, and we pray, and we ask God to lift that veil, look, if I stay out there all day, it's like fishing, and one person, now out here, everyone took a track. When you're in New York, the thing you're dealing with there is apathy. You're dealing with hardcore apathy and resistance, threats. I've had Multiple times I've had my life threatened. I've had people come into the church and actually in the middle of the service come up and stick an all in my chest and try to push it through my chest. And I had to fight back and praise the Lord, I had the strength. And uh, I'm telling you, 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 you will see things that you don't normally see. It, I mean, it happens here, but because of the, everything's piled on top of each other. It's incredible. And since, since COVID and since defunding the police, you're primarily on your own. You, you, you can't call the police? Are you kidding? Don't call us. If there's a car accident, they won't come unless uh, there's someone seriously injured. You are really on your own. Don't expect anybody to come help you anymore. You're on your own. So, yeah, I mean, the stakes are different, but the gospel is the same. And if we consistently apply the word of God, God will use us. He'll use you. He wants to use you. How, all the more as we see the day approaching. Is it just for us to know everything about what's coming? No. How can you have any joy from that? He wants us to tell others. He wants us to share it. Now, I'm going to show a video in a little bit of how we do it in New York. Because what happened to me was the Lord told me, he told me, go out there and get a bus. I'd go get a bus. Believe it or not, somebody came up to me and said, hey, by the way, I got a bus for sale. Would you like to buy it? I couldn't believe it. Then the Lord said to me, go get a bus. And in the middle of New York, they've seen everything. But why don't you come up with something they haven't seen? Take your bus and stick a cross on the top of it so that everybody can see it. Then go get a table. Go get Bibles, free Bibles, and start handing out Bibles to people. Now, yeah, start handing out Bibles to people. Now, once this happens, Jesus will use you. But the next step is this. 
He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to me, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to me, tend my sheep. Discipleship. Now, this isn't just for, you know, converts. We're out there to see people actually be discipled, to see them raised up. Now we've got the goods. We've got the word of God, sound teaching. We've got the desire to want to see people get saved. We've got Bible prophecy saying Jesus is coming soon, and we have a, uh, a window of opportunity that's shutting real quick. It's shutting quick, 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 quick. So, you know, I actually got the concept from the prayer mobile up in Watsonville. Uh, I, went to, I hadn't seen my friend in 30 years. I got a little book. I don't want to run too late, long, but I got a book in the mail. A friend I hadn't seen in 30 years. He was a Jewish guy. And we used to party together and drink. And uh, in the book it said, he got his black belt in karate. 30 years later they sent me out. You know, this is where all your high school friends are. And uh, he's a born-again Christian. I thought, wow, that's amazing. So what I did was me and my wife got in our car. I thought, go. I got my car in Patterson, New Jersey. Drove out to California. I don't think I flew. Drove all the way out. My daughter lives in Santa Clarita, but I drove up to Watsonville. And uh, when I got there, my friend, I knocked at the door. And it, this was weird, too. I'll tell you another weird story really quickly. I knock at the door. It's this big house on a mountain. I'm like, man, I haven't seen this guy in 30, 35 years. What's he going to say? The door opens a crack. He goes, oh, no, it's you. The door shuts, right? The guy runs into his house. I'm standing there with my wife for five minutes. Like, what is going on? He comes, and he's an artist. He's done the McEnroe exhibit. He's done a lot of... He's, on, he's like a who's who of artists and stuff like that. He, five minutes, I'm standing there. He comes running back down, opens the door, and he has a picture. And he says to me, look at this. That's you. He said, that's the first picture I ever drew in my entire life of a person. And he remembered it was me. Now, that's pretty good. <laughs> we don't look the same. But uh, that was really weird. And he goes, I got to tell you, I said, Man, I heard you got saved. He says, yeah, man, the Lord sent me out here, and he told me to call this lady on the radio. And she's on the radio, and she's got this Cadillac, and she goes into Santa Cruz with a sign on top of it. And I want you to come with me. And so that's how this concept, the going back to the bus with the thing and the Lord telling me, go get the bus, it, it all had that germin germinated when I was up in Santa Cruz with my buddy. And uh, it was, the Lord just showed me, look, nothing's changed, David. Okay, things have changed, but look, the gospel's the gospel. It's time to preach. So that was uh, in 2003. In 2006, we had our first disciple. My first guy, another quick story. These are not embellished. It's the absolute truth my wife will tell you. I am driving down 3rd Avenue going 20 miles an hour, 25 miles an hour, in front of the church where we are, which we weren't in that building, nothing in that building at all. As I'm going down, the streets of New York are filled. You'll see on the video. I look over and I see one person, one person, and he's standing there like this, handing things out. And my wife looks at him, and he's, he, he's a gang member from Hunts Point. And, the Lord, and I got this thing, pull your car over right now and go talk to him. My wife says, don't you dare. Don't go, don't you dare go, oh, that guy's dangerous. What are you doing? So I listened to the Lord. I pulled the car over, got out, walked up, began to speak to him the word of God. And he had been, his name's Antonio. He's been through a lot. And uh, the Holy Spirit just, brought conviction. He didn't get saved the first time, maybe not even the second time. Every week I said to him, I'll be back next week. I'm going to talk to you more about Jesus. And I'd go back, and I'd go back. And then he got saved, and he got saved right in front of the church where God has us today. Until this day, he's part of our ministry. And it's amazing how God can do these things. It's divine. It's divine. I believe in 
divine providence, that God is able. He can do amazing things like that. So this is the thing about us. In 2023, I'm not lying. I'm going to say one more thing. In 2007, I went to Baltimore. My wife was sick. We had to go to John Hopkins. I'm at, in John Hopkins University with my wife. And again, God told me, I'm going to open a church in Baltimore. My wife's right here. I told her, there's going to be a church in Baltimore. Now, at that time, there was no one in our congregation, no one that was coming to church that was from Baltimore, nothing to do with Baltimore at all. But lo and behold, in 2015, a brother named Jerry DiMatteo ended up coming to uh, the open door. He started attending the church. And in 2019, he came forward and he told me, I think the Lord's leading me to move to Baltimore. And he, he happens to own apartment buildings, a few apartments down in, in Baltimore. He wanted to move back there, so he moved back there. And from there, um, uh, Brother Chris Blaze, Brother uh, Greg Windsor, Brother Jerry Collins, uh, they've all come together. And in 2023, God, as he promised, opened a church in Baltimore. Now, one thing I would say is uh, we do have a, a need and we, we do have a strong doctrinal foundation at the open door. We do preach the word. We don't uh, mince words. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And in New York, you can't be. I mean, people are going to challenge you. You have to be willing to stand up. And that's exactly what God told me to do. But in New York and in Baltimore, we have no problem evangelizing publicly on the streets of New York and Baltimore. No problem. And the good thing about it is we're training the younger ones to do the same thing. They are into evangelizing their friends, which is really awesome. I saw Marco showed me a video of a young girl that here in a school that she was able to uh, proclaim the gospel, and all these people came, and there were a number of professions, and I thought, that is so wonderful. That is the, hey, look, you know, that's the foundation of the church. Jesus is coming soon, but we have to plan, you know, plan for the future, but don't plan on it. And so we got to plan. We got to see these younger ones get raised up. So, you know, in these difficult times, in spite of persecutions, threats, apathy, indoctrination, uh, God wants us to make disciples. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in me, my words, you are truly my disciple. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now, with all these things coming, the indoctrination, the apathy, we are, we're not to be ignorant of Satan's designs. We know what he's trying to do. Our, but here's this. Here's our job. This is what it says. Scripture says it. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. That's it. we got to allow the Lord to use us. He's gracious. He's kind. He wants to. It's a golden opportunity. People don't know. They see what's happening. They're confused. And look, if you're fishing and nobody catches anything that night, pray. Ask God which side of the boat to, to put out your net. He'll bring them. He'll bring them. God is faithful. Don't worry about it. God is faithful. So I'm going to read a couple verses, just a couple more, and then I'm going to close here, and then we'll do the couple-minute video. It says, He who watches the wind for all conditions to be perfect will not sow seed, and he who looks at the clouds will not reap. So we got to stay focused on Jesus. If you look at circumstances, it, you know, people look like giants sometimes in New York. They look like, Wow. You know, you know, you're talking to people, it's like fear. But God wants to overcome that. And it says in Psalm 120, 26, 5 and 6, may those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Now, you would think if you would sow tears, you would reap tears. But God's flipped it, man. If you sow tears with tears, crying and weeping over the condition of the way you see things, you're going to have shouts of joy when you reap. You are going to be so so encouraged by seeing what God wants to do through you, through you. Hey, look, I'm nobody. Jesus is everybody. That's what it's all about. It's all about him, man. 
So that's it. Um, I really don't have anything more to say, but I do want to show you a brief idea of what we do uh, in New York and for just two minutes. Hopefully we can show that video. Amen. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. Thank you, everyone. Hey, thank you so much, brother. I have to apologize. I was supposed to introduce him, but then he ran up here really quick, and he beat me to it. And I said, well, thank you, Lord. He's going to do it. So, uh, But uh, it, it, was, it was so good. It was so good to hear. Uh, and I, I asked him to do this. He... he um, he did it because I asked him, but he was very kind to do it. Uh, I, I wanted you guys to know more about Dave and his ministry there and how he came to the Lord, but also what he does with what the Lord has given him. And it was such a uh, such pure joy to see uh, a man who really loves the Lord, but loves people and the lost. And that's what the Lord told us to have, right? When we lose our first love, and like in the um, book of Revelation to the church of Ephesus, they lost their first love. They left their first love, the love of Jesus. Loving him, loving other believers, and loving the lost. When that happens, it's a church that really is struggling with love. Uh, no matter how much they say, uh, we need to love the Lord, we need to love each other, we need to love the lost. And that's really what a church is supposed to be be doing. So, um, well, welcome, welcome. This is uh, the first session, Prophecy and the uh, Gospel and Prophecy. And so good to have Dave Rosetto from Open Door Fellowship, and his wife Joanne is here. Where are you, Joanne? Yeah, God bless you. Welcome, welcome in the name of the Lord. And um, we're going to have lunch soon, so when we have lunch, we can fellowship and talk to him and ask him lots of questions, like, how do you do it? That's the one question that goes, how do you guys do this? Especially in New York, isn't it? Like, um, Dave was telling me stories about this, and I'm going like, out here is easy compared to New York. It's like, uh, we should have no excuses for not to do it. You know, it's hard, and there are people that are very hard and very difficult, but the culture itself in New York is a lot different than talking to him the last couple of days. It's... it's um, it's awesome that he, the Lord has him working there in the field in New York, but also in Baltimore. So uh, what a wonderful, wonderful thing. So uh, we have our brother Jacob Prash. He's going to come up in a few uh, to share God's word with us. So welcome, Jacob, again. <laughs> right before we bring Jacob, I wanted to have a brother from this church, from this fellowship, 
uh, to come and share a little bit what the Lord has done in his life. And uh, just what Dave was talking about, how to hear the gospel, there's a transformation, there's a change, there's conversion, you're, uh, you're a new creation in Jesus. Now you got to get discipled. Now the Lord has to tend, we have to tend to the Lord's sheep. We have to feed them. We have to tend to them. And that's part of the uh, aspect of salvation. It's just not a one, uh, just a one-time thing. It's a one day you do it and that's it. But you hear a lot of that in, in, in Christian circles. But it's an ongoing with Jesus, an ongoing relationship with them. And, and moving on forward from justification to being sanctified and by God's grace will be glorified at the resurrection. That's where prophecy comes in, right? Because we're looking forward to that day. But what happens between justification and that glorification moment, the resurrection, and it's this period of time, it depends how long we live, that is we're to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. And that's what uh, Dave's fellowship is about. That's what our fellowship is about. I, uh, I, I admire him so much for what he does and shares the gospel and disciple people. So um, let's emulate that in our own personal lives, our own personal lives. But as a church, specifically in, in our fellowship here at Community Church of DeVore, um, we're all about that. That's exactly what we're here for. And there's nothing uh, else to do except glorify Jesus, build each other up, and let's save the lost. All right, so we have books in the back for Jacob and uh, David Lister's back there. David, how you doing, David? No, David Lister's back there. Praise the Lord. <laughs> plenty of books, plenty of good food, and you can avail yourself of that. Some of you guys have done that already. But I'm going to have our brother Andre come up, and uh, for a few minutes, he'll share with you what the Lord has done in his life. We asked him, our elders uh, and I, we talked about it, and I said, hey, you know what, I'd like to have Andre come up and share his... Uh, a little bit the Lord has done for him in his life and uh, his family comes to this fellowship and come on up brother and he is going to tell you what the Lord has done in his life. Amen. Thank you brother. Thanks for sharing. Uh, good, morning. good morning. Most of you guys know me and my wife, our three little kids. We've been coming here for about a year and a half. Um. I don't know why they chose me, to be honest with you, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm always here for the glory of God. So I'm, I'm going to start at the beginning because that's always a good place to start. So I was born in Jamaica. Many people don't know that. Most people think I'm from Watts or Compton or so I'm totally. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I totally have a different culture, different way that I view things. Right. And starting from a young age, I remember being inundated as early as I can remember with sexual thoughts. I was also a liar. I lied about everything, about everything I did. Even when there was no need to lie, I just lied. I just liked lying. I, I, I wanted to fantasize my life was bigger than it really was, you know. Um, and uh, I was overwhelmed with fear. So it wasn't until they asked me to share my testimony that I really started to look back that those three things from the time I was five was surrounding me at all times, right? Fear, lies, right? And sexual thoughts, right? I came to America in 91. I was seven, so I was born in 83, right? At the age of nine, um, a friend of the family who happened to be a Christian, he had a personal mission to reach the youth. So in the neighborhood, he would take us hiking, he would take us camping, he would take us fishing. But I just thought he wanted to expose us to these things. And it was cool, right? Like, I'm here catching, you know, bass and perch and salmon and all these things. Maybe not those, but, you know, I'm catching fish. Never did that before. I'm hiking. I'm learning about bears. But the whole time, he had a sneaky ulterior motive, and that was to tell us about Jesus. Right. So he would he would like start these conversations. And I was just really intrigued because when I was younger, my mom would sing, uh, you know, two or three. She was saying, you know, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. And so I had a little bit of a reverence for God, not knowing, you know, and she was she's not even a Christian. My family's not Christian. They don't care about that. But she just thought it was a nice thing. So I'm like, who is this Jesus? And I wanted to know him. So over the course of about four years, he gave me the gospel and I had never heard the gospel. Right. So I'm nine, 10, 11. Right. And and he told me about what God has done in his life and how God changed him and what he used to be. So I was like, wow, I want to know this God like this is powerful. At around 13, 
I started to feel that void and I started to realize how just how much of a sinner I was and that I really was not on par with God. See, I was a good little I was the kind of person who was a manipulator. I was always good and said the right things in front of people. I knew how to manipulate people. And I'm sad to say, especially women, especially women. was You didn't get away with it with men too much. So I didn't like that because men would expose you. You know, men wouldn't be as easy to come in. But the ladies in the neighborhood, I can convince them of anything. Right. <clears throat> anyway, so about 13, you know, I started to see my sin and he led me to the Lord. Uh, we were fishing one night. I said, hey, I want to be saved. I'm a sinner. Like I have these thoughts. I have these fears. But prior to that, um, almost every night I lived in fear. I could hear uh, now I know it's demons, but I could hear people saying how they're going to break into our house and how they're going to attack our family. And I was tormented. I couldn't go to sleep. And I'm the only male in my family. It's my mom, my auntie, and my cousin. So a lot of times I thought I would be protecting them. I can't share these things with them. But I would be battling these things by myself, battling these things, along with lying and along with the sexual thoughts, Right. So he led me to the Lord and the craziest thing happened within a week. All the thoughts stopped. No more crippling fear. No more crippling fear. So I knew something was real about this because I've been dealing with that for years. No more crippling fear. But unfortunately, you have friends, you know. So I get saved. I'm excited. I'm a excited young man about the Lord. I want to be about the things about the Lord. And I'm going to church. I'm, I'm on campus. I'm, I'm telling people about Jesus. I'm inviting people to um, worship services. And, and I'm praying every day as I read my Bible that God will cleanse my mind. And I started to think less about sexual thoughts. And I started to lie less. Things just started to become just offensive to me. But then... Pornography came into my life. So this is about 99 AOL. I don't know if you remember. You got mail. You guys remember that? <laughs> AOL. You got mail and the and the disc and all that kind of stuff. Now we were open to chat rooms. We were open to porn sites. The good thing about that was, was that um, my mom kind of watched me heavily. So I wasn't really able to get deep into it. But I had a friend who his neighbor's father had like a collection of it. So, of course, we started going through those and God and his grace moved them away. It was amazing. Like within two months, moved them away. But I had, I, I had gotten a taste of something in my spirit. But I forgot about it, kept going on, went to college, went to college, got my own job, bought cable. And I fell first uh, headlong into pornography, pornographic sin, just watching it all the time. I would miss classes watching pornography. I was, I was that hooked and that addicted. So I had a girlfriend at the time and luckily I was still a virgin. And this is, this is, this is the thing I I looked at as I thought about it, right? I reached college without losing my virginity. Then I got my first real girlfriend. We started to spend a lot of time alone together. Inevitably we started to explore as I was about to lose my virginity. I remember my roommate pounding on the door, shouting that he needed to pay his bills he was in an absolute panic. I had never seen him like that before. I now realized that that was God trying to stop me from making one of the worst decisions of my life. Losing my virginity led down a dark path filled with one night stands, paying for prostitutes, STDs, abortions, um, which still grieves me to this day. After that night, it was almost 10 to 12 years of turmoil, a little repentance, but a boatload of bondage and sexual sin and a raging porn addiction. And so I say that just to say, you know, we play with certain things and, you know, for your father, you know, protect your kids, their eyes from pornography. Turn off the computer because that increased my lust and made me go after what I wanted to I was a little Christian kid, kind of happy doing my thing, but that kind of, you know, made it worse. So I never struggled with this. A couple years later, after losing my virginity, I was working as an armored guard, picking up and delivering money. I kept a loaded gun in my closet, 
but I was about to realize how dangerous that was. I had flunked out of college and my girlfriend at the time had just broken up with me. As I laid in my bed, the voices and fear that I had not heard for years since I was 13 and got saved returned. Right? The whole night I tossed and turned. I could hear the demons tell me to take the gun in the closet and end it all. My sin had pushed me so far from God that I was back on Satan's turf. Right. Ten years earlier, the freedom that God had granted me, I had given up because of my lust. But God is faithful. When I was at my lowest point that night, gun in hand, wanting to escape the pain that I felt and being a failure beyond all the urging to end my life. I heard a still small voice saying, don't do it. Hell is real. Beyond all the screams of you're going to escape this. I heard something say, don't do it. Hell is real. I, like my blood runs cold. That was just the encouragement I needed. Right? <laughs> Thank you. Praise God. So, lost my virginity. That girl, my first real girlfriend in college, uh, ran into her years later. You know, I'm, I'm cool. Macked her up. We head back to her place. Um, started to do what we shouldn't do. Right? And there's a knock at the door. She grabs me and I said, who is that? Because I'm thinking, you know, she said, that's my husband. Oh. I said, you're what? She said, that's my husband. He tries to get in another another moment. God has his hand on me. He tries to get in and the door is locked with this big old bolt. Not not a, quite a chain, but he couldn't really get in. He, he was weak because he could have kicked it in. But. God is good, right? The angels was holding that door. I run out in my underwear, and he, she says to him, I thought we were on a break. He says, uh, who's in there? And she says, I'm here with someone. I'm like, don't tell him that, right? So she, uh, she jumps up. He said, okay. He said, I'll leave, but hand me my gun. She picks up his weapon from under the table, starts to hand it to him through the door. I grab the weapon. I said, what are you doing? He's going to come in here and kill us. Like, what's wrong with you? So after a while, he, he said, I'll be right back. And I listened for his car to leave. Right? This is how far my sin had gotten me. Right? I listened for his car to leave. Heard him drive out in the driveway. Ran through probably two blocks in my underwear. Humiliated. Jumped in my car. Heart pounding. Took off. Never seen her again. This was... Nine years separated from when I first lost my virginity to her. Not only did we abort a child, but now I'm helping to destroy a marriage. And it was funny because about a week later, God flashed me back to me and my Christian friends saying how wrong it was to abort kids. And how we would never destroy someone's marriage. I was a Calvary Chapel kid. I don't know if you know Calvary Chapel. So we were pretty serious about God and we wanted to be about the Lord. So with the same girl, nine years apart, I had broken two vows that I had made to the Lord or that I, he was, it was building me up in. It gets better. I worry. Right. Sin was just no more fun. Right. In fact, before I started that, I'm going to talk about um, uh, preaching because the brother talked about that. Street preachers, those that go out are really important. This is a side note, and and I actually wrote him this morning. During that time, while on a date with my arm around a young lady, already planning to sin with her, I walked past a street preacher. Sign in hand, and the words, no fornicator shall inherit eternal life. I didn't know what else the sign said, but I know it said that, and the words were almost in red I mean, blazoned in my head, I got so sober from planning to do something wrong to now I am afraid that I'm going to die right there and God is going to judge me. Right? Those words cut right through me. I thought about them for weeks. In fact, I was unable to go through with my plan that night of defiling that young lady. It made me start to think of my eternity. For anyone who thinks street witnessing is ineffective you're wrong a street preacher stopped me from defiling one more girl 
adding one more sin to my life and planted a seed that led to repentance. Sin was no more fun. I felt like a slave. It, it, it starts out as fun. That's what sin always does. But then after a while, the veil drops and you, and you realize I'm a slave. Right? <clears throat> I started to seek out a church home because I knew that I, I, that having a support system of people to pray for you and encourage you was key. I found a church and started to go faithfully. Slowly, my desires for righteousness, holiness, and truth started to increase. I was reading my word more and more. I started to go months between um, instances of sexual sin with my girlfriend. I knew that I couldn't continue in my life of sexual sin because now the conviction was too high. As I read my word one day, I came across 1 Corinthians 7, 9. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. <laughs> I wanted to be faithful to God. So acting upon the word, I proposed to my girlfriend at the time, even though deep down I did not want to marry her. Even the day I put the ring on her finger, I had no peace. When I thought of our future, I felt uneasy. I didn't know what to do. I wanted to be right with God. And I knew that living a life of fornication was against his will. And I just couldn't seem to get away from this girl. We would break up and get back together a couple months later. And though she wasn't the best, at least sometimes she would come to church. At least sometimes she would read the Bible and we would go months without, you know, um, sinning, you know, sexually. So I was stuck. I started to seek the Lord because it was obvious he was not giving me the peace with this decision. I felt there is wisdom in many counselors. Why don't I share with some of the brothers at the church? Maybe they could give me direction. I tried to get some wisdom and prayer from the senior pastor but he was busy with a huge line in front of him. And I remember this day. So the assistant pastor motions for me to come over and get prayer. Who wants the assistant pastor praying for him? The real power is the pastor, right? Right. The senior pastor. That's who God listens to. That's how we feel sometimes. Right. That's who God listens to. We don't, I don't know this guy. But anyway, so I reluctantly went down. I sat down with the pastor, told him of my proposal and lack of peace. He said something I would never forget. And I had not thought about. He said, let's pray that God will show you what's in this woman's heart. The next two weeks were eye opening. I saw fits of rage and anger like I had never seen before. It all culminated while we were on the freeway and arguing as usual. She grabbed my Bible from the dash and threw it out the window. I was stunned and she cackled, threw her head back and laughed. I knew then that this was not the woman for me and I needed to get away from her immediately. <laughs> once, I once I finally broke ties with her, I started to ease into a life of celibacy for the first time in years. I felt more peace and joy. I felt closer to God than I ever had. About a year later, he brought a woman into my life through eHarmony, our first a uh, couple conversations lasted five or six hours. We spoke of his glory, his faithfulness, his love, and all he had done in our lives. We spoke of future plans and a desire to reach the world for him. We both were unwilling to compromise on sex outside of marriage. I knew that what I needed, I knew, I knew what I needed, but I still was skeptical. You see, I never made the right choice when it came to women. And if I was to make this commitment, I needed to see God working in her life. So I thought, I'm going to play hardball with God. Lord, I feel that this woman is special, but I, if I am to marry her, I needed to see some things I had never seen in any woman around me. Right? So I got the big idea. I said, you know, I'm enjoying being single. Part of it was fear. I didn't want to get married, but I did want to get married at the same time. But I knew it was what I was supposed to do. So I said, okay, I'm going to throw something at God I don't think he'll be able to do. Right? I said, okay, I need to know these six things, God. Does she submit? Does she submit to you, to your word, and will she submit to me? When, when, she, does get, when she doesn't get her own way, 
Can she still be kind and respectful? Does she fear spiritual contamination? And lastly, are you more important than her desires and her family? I had never seen any, any woman fulfill all those in my life. So I said, certainly she can't. I can go on being single, being happy, and I don't have to change, right? I don't have to stop eating what I want to eat. I don't have to, you know, right? So I was playing hardball with God. So I laid that out in my prayers thinking, I got him now. He can't do that. I've never seen it, right? Certainly he would not bring me something I have never seen. And one by one over the next year, he showed me all those qualities in her. The last one to fall was, does she fear spiritual contamination? She called me and I said, hey, I thought you were at your dance class with your friend. She said, yeah, I am. I just stepped out because I didn't want to be part of dancing to this music where I didn't know what they were saying. They could be worshiping demons or casting curses. So I left. <laughs> you all know her. Her name is Cynthia. No, it's Janae. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I hung up the phone, mouth wide open. She had been looking forward to this dance class with her best friend, and she willingly gave it up just at the possibility that she may uh, contaminate herself or offend God. I can almost hear God say, gotcha. <laughs> I called my sister and I said, we need to go ring shopping. When I finally put the ring on her finger, I felt peace and excitement. Right? Right? My first year of marriage, I changed in many ways I couldn't imagine. I still wasn't totally free of porn, <clears throat> and that haunted me. Satan used the fear of being exposed as a, a fraud to frighten me and keep me in fear, so I exposed myself. I told my new wife of my years-long struggle, and I told a few brothers and asked for accountability. I destroyed any and all devices I ever used to watch porn, and it worked. The enemy always used fear in my life to torment me, but I exposed myself and sought freedom. Then he lost his power. Slowly, my desire for porn dwindled to nothing, and the peace I felt skyrocketed. For the first time in 15 plus years, I was free. God cleaned my mind and my soul as I confessed my sins and trusted in him. Later, he commissioned me to preach to the lost. Me, the little boy who lived in fear, now boldly proclaims repentance and faith in Jesus. Sometimes I sit back in amazement that God has brought me this far. Though there is still more work to do, I know that being with him, I could truly do all things. Thank you. Thank you, brother. That was awesome. Praise the Lord for that. And uh, I mean, it, it's we have a man's ministry. We have Bible studies for men, uh, sometimes on Zoom, sometimes here. And um, every struggle that the guy said, it's it's every man's struggle. Every Christian struggles with that. Even as a Christian, you struggle in some way with that. And uh, the need to have other men pray for you and be accountable yeah. to, you, it's, it's far beyond measure. And uh, and the Lord delivered him, and uh, now he preaches the gospel on the streets, and you can hear him. He's a good preacher, so praise the Lord for that. Andre, God bless you, brother.